Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for the second edition of the Climate Reality Project Canada's webinar series from coast to coast, or sorry, one coast to the others, Canada's regions speak up on climate. This is a program of presentations given once a month by climate reality leaders who were trained by Al Gore to communicate the science of and solutions to climate change and to lead their communities in a just transition to carbon neutrality. I'm just going to make this full screen. Hey, we trust that the stories of determination and resilience you're about to hear will inspire you to lead change in your own community. My name is Kelly Rana, and I'm the lead mentor for the region of Saskatchewan. Today, you will hear from a climate reality leader, Margaret Asmus, who is joining us live from Saskatchewan. This presentation will be approximately 30 minutes long and will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A period. So if you have any questions, I invite you to hold on to them or enter them into the chat. And Margaret will be happy to take them at the end of this webinar. I'm now going to introduce Margaret. Margaret is a mostly retired sustainability educator who has been involved with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. For a decade, Margaret worked as the SES. Margaret was the sustainability coordinator at the University of Saskatchewan for 14 years. She currently serves as the volunteer co-coordinator of the Regional Center of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development in Saskatchewan, a UN-affiliated network of sustainability educators. Margaret currently lives in rural Saskatchewan, but has strong ties to urban Saskatchewan. She is partic particularly interested in how rural and small urban Saskatchewan responds to environmental challenges. With no further ado, get ready to learn about local impacts of climate change in Saskatchewan. Margaret, take it away. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so um, as Kelly mentioned, I'm affiliated with a number of env environmental organizations, and I'm going to be drawing heavily on uh, the work of some of those environmental organizations. But I do want to clarify that any opinions that I express during the course of this webinar are mine. Uh, I'm not representing any of those organizations. So I'm going to scare my, uh, share my screen now and turn my video off and then we will proceed. Okay, is, is my screen being shared? Yeah, I see it. Good, wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the, the questions that uh, most of the climate reality presentations start with is must we change, can we change, and, and will we change? The first question, must we change? Um, You've all seen this slide. We're spewing 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into, the, into our atmosphere every 24 hours. And of course, we're all contributing to that. And what is Saskatchewan's contribution? Uh, this is a breakdown of Saskatchewan's greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector. So you can see that um, agriculture is significant, as is the oil and gas industry, and as is the production of electricity. Uh, unlike other provinces that have a good hydro resource, uh, Saskatchewan has uh, for many years had very strong fossil fuel based electricity. We have a lot of water, but it's all in the far north, so it's not that easily, accept well, it's not all in the far north, but much of it is in the far north, so it, it's not that easily accessible for uh, hydro in the way that uh, other provinces have. So that gives you a sense of the, the breakdown that we have in Saskatchewan. Um, we all know the, dats, uh, the, the data about um, the global surface temperature and the departure from average and that, that, we're, that we're, we're getting increasingly warmer and that this is leading to uh, extreme weather catastrophes. Here in Saskatchewan, we've also seen climate impacts. And 
I'm, I'm going to be talking about some things that are maybe not as massive on a global scale as some of the things that we hear about in the news. When we hear about weather catastrophes, we usually hear about the big ones. Uh, and we're not really focusing on the things that are hope happening on a smaller scale, but also have their impacts because those ones don't make the news to the same extent. And in talking about these uh, impacts of extreme weather events, I'm actually going to start with a story that's very, very close to home. Now, this is a, a, a picture that probably doesn't make much sense until I explain it. Um, I live in the small community of 180 people that's called Prudhomme. Um, I was on council for 10 years. And uh, these are two satellite pictures, uh, one taken in 2002 and one taken in 2012 of an area close to the village. I'm going to use my cursor here. The village is here. And if you go down here, uh, what you'll see there is a, uh, our sewage lagoon. And this is a totally dried up uh, Ducks Unlimited wetland. Uh, there used to be water here. There, there was an extensive water and these are all duck nesting islands. 2002 was right in the middle of the 1999-2004 drought, which was the worst drought that Saskatchewan had seen in a hundred years. Uh, the, if we fast forward to 2012, which is the other picture, so there's only 10 years difference there, uh, we, the lagoon has disappeared. This is exactly the same area. Here's the village. Uh, this is where the wetland used to be in this area. The, the duck nests have disappeared and the lagoon has disappeared because we had several exceptionally wet years that included three one in 100 year rain events. Uh, we had to build a new sewage lagoon for the price of 2.1 million, which is a hefty price tag for a village of 40 households. But luckily the province picked up 85% of the cost. But here's the kicker. This sort of thing was happening all over the province. PDAF, uh, the Provincial Disaster Assistance Fund, was helping communities all over Saskatchewan deal with the consequences of all of that water. Here are some statistics on the uh, Provincial Disaster Assistance Program. And if you know, between 2002, 2012, right at the tail end of those very wet years, the money spent on disaster assistance in Saskatchewan multiplied by a factor of 100. Even after going down between 2012 and 2017, it's still about 20 times what it was in 20, uh, 2002. So this is not just inflation. There's, there's something else going on. Um, another example, close to home. Uh, in 2007, Highway 27, this is a highway. The highway heading to Prudhomme looked like this. It looked like a war zone. A number of factors um, contributed to, to its degradation, including uh, that it was a thin membrane road and that we had lost our elevator. But what did it in in the end was that the water table was so high that the road was basically floating on water. Uh, the state of this road had economic impact on businesses in our village and took some lives. Uh, rebuilding this road was a multi-year project that, that cost the province millions of dollars. Again, this was not an isolated incident. Those very wet years contribute to the disintegration of roads throughout Saskatchewan, and it came at an environmental, but as well a financial and social cost to all of us. And the reason I illustrate this is because I think sometimes the things that are happening close to home, we don't necessarily register as being part of this, this bigger issue that is going on. But what about other impacts in the province? Um, in 2015, we had wildfires in the northern part of our province in the boreal forest that cost the province $100 million just to fight the fires. The province blew through its firefighting budget in no time. And this 100 million doesn't even include the cost of the losses incurred. Thousands of people had to be evacuated from the region and out of province firefighters were brought in to help with the effort. Uh, there was smoke throughout the province uh, and Saskatchewan's a pretty big province <laughs> causing respiratory people for, for people at risk. 
But just as heat feeds forest fires, it also underlies drought. Uh, we've seen the effect of drought here in Saskatchewan. Uh, as I said, that drought between 1999 and 2004 was the, was the worst one in over 100 years in, in the Canadian prairies. And agricultural production in that one year dropped by 6.3 billion in one year. In my small town, the drought of uh, that drought caused water conflicts. The, the village's water supply comes from a small aquifer. And as the drought continued and surface water dried up, area farmers started to use village water for their livestock, which overtaxed the village's supply. It was difficult to find a balance that did not cause controversy and discontent and that respected the needs of everyone concerned. So that same heat that pulls moisture from the soil causing longer and deeper droughts also causes evaporation of water from the ocean causing bigger downpours and, and flooding events. Uh, here in Saskatchewan, we're seeing more oscillations between opposing streams of flood and drought in close geographical proximity. Uh, this is Saskatchewan, a, a record breaking, breaking summer flood that devastated the Assiniboine River Basin in 2014. A year later, widespread drought again impacted large areas across Western Canada in 2015. So, you know, these things are, are these events are happening back to back. Both events, again, cost billions of dollar, uh, uh, dollars in damages and the livelihoods of, of many farmers. This is a, oh, I think I skipped a, oh, oh. I, oh, okay, and this is, um, I just want to show this. These are some slides from the Prairie Climate Center out of the, the University of um, Winnipeg that's doing a lot of really good work around modeling the effects of climate change on the, on the prairie region. And what this looks at is, is um, the redder the scale is, the more annual days uh, there would be over plus 30 in, in the prairie region. And I'm just gonna go through a number of scenarios here to show if we were to go a low carbon route in the near future, we'd, we'd see a little bit of an increase in those very hot days. A low carbon, uh, uh, a high carbon scenario in the near future, you can see that it's getting a little bit worse. A low carbon scenario in the far future, it's starting to get very, very, uh, red in terms of the number of days that will be plus 30. And if we continue on our high carbon route, this is what we would be looking at. So by the end of the century, the number of hot summer days at many locations in the prairies may trip or even quadruple in the high carbon scenario. Uh, this would in increase the number of very hot days and amplify the risks of heat wave, droughts and forest fires. I've also included one here that is a, a personal favorite of mine. Uh, this was uh, supplied by the Climate Reality Project in terms of projections of the, the traveling of, of ticks or the migration of ticks to, uh, northward. And the reason I include it is because um, I grew up with no ticks at all in Saskatchewan. And now we deal with them all the time. I have a very furry dog. And especially this time of year, I'm basically having to pick dozens of ticks off of the dog uh, every day. So I'm, I'm, I'm really in a very concrete way experiencing what the models project in terms of the expansion of uh, ticks in um, Canada and especially in the Saskatchewan region. Previously ticks were pretty well non-existent non in, in Saskatchewan. So, must we change? Well, yes, I think so. Um, we, we maybe don't have the, uh, the not yet, the, 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 the really huge extreme weather events and catastrophes that they're seeing elsewhere, but certainly we are seeing the impacts. And, and, we're, and it's costing us. It's costing us billions of dollars in lost revenue, but also in, in damages. But can we change? 
Well, my, my message is that many Saskatchewan people are already showing that we can change. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some individuals and families, some businesses, some organizations, and some communities, and even in some cases government, uh, where we're seeing really good progress, where we're seeing things happen that are uh, good for the planet and, and also good for the people who are involved. So I'm going to start with a, fa a, f a farm story. Uh, this is the Axton family farm. It's a, um, the Axtons call themselves soil farmers rather than crop farmers. It's a large dry land farm, about 6,000 acres, and it's close to the U.S. border. So it's uh, really far south, and it's a very, very dry area of the province, and that gets a lot less rain than other provinces, uh, parts of the province. Um, now, the Axnans by no means would call themselves uh, environmentalists or tree huggers. They are just people who wanted to make changes to improve their soil, and in the process, inadvertently, they became climate champions. They have a really interesting backstory. I'm not going to tell it here because it's, there's not enough time, but if you're interested in it, I would suggest that you go to the uh, Saskatchewan Environmental Society website that has a, uh, a detailed history of, of the uh, uh, Axon family farm and also what they're doing on their farm. Before I talk about what they're doing on their farm, though, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with, with farming. Um, there's really sort of main, three main sources. Uh, obviously, carbon dioxide, which comes from the combustion of fossil fuels and that sort of thing. But I'm going to focus in the, this story uh, that I'm going to tell about the accidents on two other things. One is nitrous oxide, so that's N2O. N2O comes from mainly fossil fuel con consumption and notably nitrogen fertilizer use and manure management. Though the tonnage of nitri uh, nitrous oxide emitted is much less than that of CO2, it contributes significantly to war warming because ton for ton, its warming effect is about 265 times more powerful than CO2. The other one that I want to focus on is CH4 or methane, which comes from a number of sources, including livestock production. And the one, the, the reason I want to mention this is because um, this, this is an interesting one to consider in the context of a province that has a lot of grasslands. We all know the issues um, that have been identified with the production of, of cattle and the, and the production of, of methane as a result of, of cattle. In Saskatchewan, however, we're in a province that is largely grasslands and those grasslands have evolved over millennia to be at their healthiest when, they are, when there's lar large ruminants on them. And those large ruminants leave their, their waste. It used to be bison. Unfortunately, the bison is gone. And in a lot of cases, these grasslands are much healthier and, and therefore more able to uh, sequester carbon if you have cattle on them than if you were doing something else with them. So this makes the dynamic around that whole beef question very difficult because it's, it's not a black and white question. It really depends on where you are how you do it, are you doing it intensively or not intensively? Um, uh, you know, there's a really big difference between uh, non-intensive grazing or knocking down rainforest or um, in, intensive uh, uh, feed, feed, uh, feed operations and that sort of thing. So this is one that, that has an interesting dynamic here because yes, globally they're part of the problem but locally especially in the grassland ecosystem they're also part of the solution and so it's it's, it's not a simple dynamic going back to the axtons they've done some really, really interesting things uh, one of the things that they're doing is intercropping which basically means growing more than one crop in a field at one time 
Um, intercropping is a strategy that helps reduce soil depletion and erosion and controls weeds uh, and uses less pesticides. It also supports biodiversity and soil health by providing habitat for a greater diversity of insects and soil microorganisms, all of which leads to healthier soil, which sequesters more carbon. Intercropping with legumes can also help to fix nitrogen in the soil and reduce nitrogen fertilizer use, um, which has an impact in terms of the nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, harvesting intercrops is a little bit more complex than harvesting monocrop uh, crops, and it needs a little bit of finessing, uh, but, it, but it is possible to do, and it also depends on what sort of crops. It's, it's easier for oil seeds and legumes, not so easy for wheat, but the Axtons, this, the family down in Minton, are really pushing the boundaries and trying to experiment to see uh, w what they can do with which crops. Uh, a funny story, I visited this family and they, and they said that uh, they're living right on a highway and they have their fields right on the highway and they, uh, people stop by in the farmyard and ask them what's wrong with their field because it looks so messy uh, because people in the prairies are just not used to seeing fields that look like that. They're, they're usually monocrops, very tidy. The other thing that they do that is, that is quite interesting is that they, with manure from a neighbor, uh, and other straw and hay and grain screenings and wood chips, they create big compost widrows. And once the compost is ready, some of it is spread on the fields, but they can't spread it on all of their fields. They have 6,000 acres, it's impossible. So what they do is instead, uh, Tanis, who's a biology teacher, um, uses a microscope to check and see which of the uh, compost rows have the strongest and mo most diverse population of beneficial organisms to make extracts and teas, which they use in a variety of ways on their fields, in their furrows, and also uh, on uh, application once the plants are coming up. Um, and one of the things they're even doing is Tannis and her son are, are uh, experimenting with red wigglers in their barn. They're, they're giving them all sorts of different feedstocks to figure out which ones make the microbially uh, most diverse um, uh, compost. So what all of this has done has really improved their, their soil health and thus they say that they're soil farmers rather than crop farmers. And the net effect has been that since 2013, they've improved their yields by about an average of 25% while reducing their input costs by 50 to 60%. Now that 50 to 60% doesn't just include nitrogen fertilizers. It also might include other chemicals or, or phosphorus, but a, a significant part of that is nitrogen fertilizers. So if they're reducing their use of nitrogen fertilizers by supporting soil health in different ways, uh, they're also reducing their contribution um, of nitrous oxide, which is a, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, what they've done may not be directly applicable to, to other farms, but it certainly does show that with uh, a bit of experimentation and looking at things a little bit differently, that there are things that can happen in agriculture, uh, which help to support the reduction of uh, nitrogen fertilizer use. The second story I'm gonna tell you about is K-Line Kennels, which is also a rural business. It's near Cronow, Saskatchewan, which is north of, of Regina. Um, K-Line, they've done all sorts of things. They, they've planted 5,000 trees. They have geothermal heat to heat the kennel. They've got a 48 kilowatt uh, solar farm that generates 100% of the kennel's electrical needs. They have an electrical boiler that supplements the geothermal system. They've done lighting retrofits. They also have a canine carpool. They're outside of Regina, so rather than, than people bringing their dogs out to them, uh, uh, the owner drives into Regina one day in a van and it's all set up to pick up dogs. But you can really see that uh, it's, it's paying for itself. 
uh, the, the solar system will pay for itself in, in nine years, the lighting retrofits in two years, and the geothermal system in, in, in 14 years. And they're reducing their uh, greenhouse gas emissions by about 125 tons per year. And they've had some side benefits. Uh, they, uh, Dan and Louise, the couple that owns the business, uh, felt that, feel that they actually have a better um, uh, life now because before they were just, they were working super, super hard just to pay the utility bills because a, a dog kennel is not uh, a low utility use. You got to keep it warm, dogs want to go in and out, that sort of thing. Uh, and they now choose to take holidays and take in fewer dogs because they can actually control their utility costs because it's not, um, um, you know, it's, it, it's in the form, I guess, of a loan. So they're just paying it off, but they don't need to be worrying about the vagaries of weather. Um, they've also had uh, the, the solar installation is, has generated really good publicity for their business. And in 2016, SAS Power even created a video about the kennel to uh, publicize its net metering program. So they've, they've been very successful with that, this approach. The SAS Solar Co-op. So SES is uh, Saskatchewan Environmental Society, which is one of the older environmental groups in the, in the province. Uh, one of the spin-offs of the uh, SES has been a solar cooperative. It's the uh, first renewable energy cooperative in Saskatchewan, and it's modeled on the German solar co-ops, which um, are reasonably uh, well known in, in, in Germany. Um, it's the first one in Saskatchewan, um, but the model is being reduced, uh, reproduced in other municipalities, most notably in Regina. They've had six uh, smaller installations, which included a festival site and a partnership with Saskatoon Car Share to offset the electrical use used by their, their EV fleet. Um, and are now embark embarking on a large project. Well, it's been running for about six months now with uh, CNH Industrial that makes tractors and industrial equipment. Um, with, and it's a 400 kilowatt capacity installation. So the, the co-op, the solar co-op idea is really good because it allows larger installations, but it allows people to get involved who are really interested in solar or want to support solar, but can't support can't afford panels themselves or have shade issues on their property or are renting or know that they're going to be moving in a couple of years. And this way they, they can support uh, the development of solar, even if they're not in the position to do it on their own. Um, the shares for the CNH industrial project apparently sold out really, really quickly. So there is interest in this. People want to want to get involved and, and support the development of solar. Another really interesting Saskatchewan first is the uh, First Nations Power Authority. Uh, the First Nations Power Authority is the only North American nonprofit Indigenous owned and controlled organization that's developing projects with Indigenous communities. I do think they, uh, I'm not 100% certain, but I do think that they do some projects outside of the province, but it's mostly Saskatchewan based. And they've had a couple of uh, fairly big projects uh, mostly on reserves, uh, two um, 10 megawatt solar installations and one um, 20 megawatt flare gas project. Uh, that reserve flying dust has also got a, an option, a second phase option where they're going to be looking at, at solar. Um, most of the members of the First Nations Power Authority are reserves, reserve communities with one exception, and that's the community of Green Lake, um, Saskatchewan. Uh, it is located in northern Saskatchewan in the boreal forest. It's, it's fairly remote. Uh, it is a Métis community, and it is, the only, as I said, the only non-reserve community that's part of the FNPA. 
it's a very interesting community. I don't want to get into the history. Again, if you're, you're interested, you can check the SES website. But the village is steeped in the history of the fur trade. And its colonial history uh, dates back to 1782 in the province. So it's one of the oldest communities in the uh, oldest colonial um, settled um, communities in the province. And it is 95% of its residents are Métis. And every year, Village Council makes a declaration affirming its status as a Métis village. Another thing that makes it special is that it has a 31.5 kilowatt solar array uh, that's on the top of their community hall. And Green Lake was the first municipality in northern Saskatchewan to go solar. The, the journey started in 2015 when Rick Richardson, the mayor who's uh, seated here with his wife, uh, went to a conference of the First Nations Power Authority and came back really enthused about solar. And with a lot of luck, they got, they got a Canada 150 grant and Bulldog, uh, Bullfrog Power jumped on board and they got um, a rebate from, from SAS Power. They were able to uh, pull together the financing for the, for the great, a big portion of their solar array. And um, the, the, it's a grid tied system, um, but the community would eventually like to see it converted to a hybrid system. A hybrid system is a grid tied system with some battery storage backup that allows it to function off grid when needed. Uh, while many of the community's 168 homes heat with wood or per pane, many are also heated electrically. Uh, the, the residents of these homes are at special risk during outages during the cold northern Saskatchewan winters. Often, uh, Rick told me that they often have two or three outages per month during the winter, and sometimes it takes days for uh, SAS Power to locate it because, it, because it's the lines are going through the boreal forest and um, and he would like to the, the community would like to have this as a hybrid uh, array so that the community center can act as a as a safe space during those um, those extreme weather events um, the northern saskatchewan is very vulnerable in terms of electrical supply as was um, demonstrated just a couple of weeks ago when there was a big fire just north of Prince Albert and much of northern Saskatchewan was knocked out in, for, in terms of electricity because it's really only a couple of lines that is even carrying the electricity from southern Saskatchewan to northern Saskatchewan. So there's a lot to be said for uh, decentralized power generation in some of these remote communities. Another really small uh, but mighty project is uh, a project called Blanket of Warmth, which was done on the Star Blanket Cree Nation. Um, it's won provincial awards. Basically, Star Blanket Cree Nation partnered with McPherson Engineering, which is out of Regina, and U of R engineering students to develop an approach to, uh, to heating on reserve homes that saves both energy and reduces mold. They created a product called Radiant, Radiant Link, which was based on the traditional design of the teepee, um, which uses heats, uh, rocks, heated rocks for, for radiant heat. Uh, Radiant Link uh, basically puts radiant coils into the base, the concrete walls of the basement to warm it up just enough to get rid of the dampness. And it also saves about 30% in the in heating costs. Uh, the intention was to create a, an approach that was both effective and easy and economical to install to reduce mold and to reduce costs, but in the progress uh, process also reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Star Blanket is now training um, people from their reserve to do these installations in homes across the reserve with the hope that this will improve the quality of the homes as well as reduce heating costs for everybody on that reserve. Uh, Saskatoon is one of the bigger communities that's taking, well, is it's the largest uh, city in Saskatchewan and it's taking leadership on uh, municipal climate action. Uh, the city has developed the low emissions community plan 
a detailed roadmap of the action for meet both community and corporate emission reductions for for 20 uh, 23 and 2050. The goal is to reduce the City of Saskatoon's emissions by 40% uh, below 2014 levels by 2023 and 80% by 2050, and the community emissions by 15% below 2014 by 2023 and 80% by 2050. So they're fairly ambitious goals. And, we're, we're, and for a while there, it was... Um, uh, we had a, a municipal elections across Saskatchewan last October, and the low emissions community plan was one of the issues in the Saskatoon election, and it was a cont contentious issue, and there were people uh, running with the intention of uh, not continuing with this. But luckily, uh, a good a council came in that is going to continue with this, and uh, progress is being made slowly but surely. One of the big things that's come in now is, is, is a PACE financing program, which will really allow uh, the residents of Saskatoon to, to do upgrades to their homes, including uh, renewables and or energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, Saskatoon, uh, Saskatchewan's second largest city, uh, Regina, is not as far along as Saskatoon, but it is embarking on a planning process to create a plan. Uh, and that was really largely pushed by civic engagement and also the election of a council that supp supports climate action. Uh, Saskatoon and Regina represent half the population of Saskatchewan. So if Saskatoon and Regina are engaging on this, it has a pretty good Im uh, impact in terms of the engagement of a, a, a a lot of people in Saskatchewan. And, and my experience has been that change in the large cities often acts as a catalyst for change in the smaller municipalities. One uh, is uh, quite astounding was the municipalities of Saskatchewan, which is an organization that represents all of the urban municipalities in, in the province. Uh, that includes big cities as well as small villages. At its convention this February, passed a motion uh, to urge the provincial government to establish a wetlands policy to help and protect, to help protect and restore wetlands. Now this might not seem really significant, but in the context of Saskatchewan, it is very significant. As you probably all know, uh, wetlands sequester carbon and scientists have identified that wet wetland uh, restoration in the prairie provinces could make a significant contribution to greenhouse gas mitigation. We have lost about 70% of our wetlands here in Saskatchewan to either agricultural or, or urban development. And Saskatchewan has been the only prov a province without a wetland policy. Um, so it is, it, is, it is really good to see that a uh, body that basically represents urban living and urban concerns has... Uh, recognize that this is an issue that is of, of critical importance to all of us, not only for habitat and, and water and all of those other reasons, but also because of the, the carbon sequestration uh, potential that we're losing by just plowing over all of these wetlands. Um, SAS Power, as, as some of you probably know, SAS Power is uh, a crown corporation. Uh, unlike other provinces, Saskatchewan does not have a lot of private utilities. It has one large crown corporation. And even the few smaller utilities that we have, they buy from SAS Power. And SAS Power has been making some progress. They've been um, moving away from coal. Uh, so in the last couple of years, they've really transitioned from being a coal-fired utility to a gas-fired utility, uh, while in, or natural gas-fired utility while increasing its, its generating capacity. And it has made commitments to basing one half its, of its generation capacity on renewable sources by 2030, uh, with particular emphasis on wind generation. And it has also committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, a lot of environmental groups feel that SAS Power can probably meet its modest 2030 goal for renewable energy generation under its current uh, course of action. Uh, 
but reaching higher levels um, post 2030 is going to be really, really challenging. And there has been a lot of uh, lobbying for enhanced actions, including interconnections to Ma Manitoba Hydro. So Manitoba has a good hydro resource, but we're not able to get any of that power. Enhanced demand side management, cogeneration opportunities, grid modernization. We have a grid that is, that is in uh, dire need of repair. And anything that we do around renewables is going to require a grid that is in better condition continue their work on utility scale wind farms and enable more utility grade solar farms. We have a lot of small solar installations, but SAS Power has never really gotten into to, to solar, although they're now uh, doing a, a pilot project, which we're hoping will lead to other things. And another thing that the province has done well um, and uh, is their methane action plan. This is part of, it came out of uh, Prairie Resilience, was, which was their made in Saskatchewan climate change strategy. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later um, because they're, in, in some ways it was a very unambitious plan, uh, but the methane action plan, which grew out of that is actually one of the things that we do have to give the credit, the, the province credit for. They have been achieving a lot there. Uh, they, Sask Energy and Resources staff estimate that 70% of the emissions reductions achieved between 2019 and 2020 were based on the implementation of their new regulations. Uh, and that 30% of the reduction that took place was because of the shutdown in oil production because of COVID. Um, the equivalency agreement between the government of Saskatchewan and the government of Canada aimed to bring methane emissions in the oil and gas sector down to 6.4 million tons by 2024. So on that basis, and taking account of the fact that the emissions are likely to rise again in 2021, the provincial government is very close to meeting its target. There are some issues. Um, the, the reduction targets were based on an estimate of our methane emissions that was provided by the, the, um, the federal government. Uh, I guess there's now consideration that perhaps those initial numbers were incorrect. So it may be that the province is not as low as it, at, as it uh, believes it's uh, come, not due to its fault, due to inaccurate numbers uh, coming from the federal government, but notwithstanding, the the reductions are real reductions. So this is this is something that we do have to give the province uh, the credit for. So we have the solutions at hand. We've we've got that you know we've got people, farmers, businesses, uh, organizations proving that. So the question is, can we change? Yes, but will we change? And my question is not so much, will we change? Because we are changing. The question is more, will we change in time? Uh, change is happening, but it's happening at a much slower rate than climate change is progressing. So for me, the, the critical question is, how do we accelerate what's already going on? And there are some major obstacles to that in Saskatchewan. Uh, the government of Saskatchewan has a growth plan um, and there's some really good stuff in it, but among the 20 actions that are included in the plan are growing the Saskatchewan oil, gas, and natural resource economy. Um, they, the province really seems to be banking on oil and gas for, for future prosperity in the province. Uh, it's looking at reducing carbon emissions in electricity production, but seems to be also banking on the development of zero emission small nu nuclear reactors. Notwithstanding any other issues that you might have, uh, that one has with nuclear, including price and, and waste disposal issues, this is, this is, in my view, not a the solution either because this technology doesn't even exist anymore it may not be online for 15 or 20 years we need the solutions now we can't wait 15 or 20 years so there's there's sort of some uh things that are happening at the provincial level that present real um challenges 
and and the and the government is is sending other uh, messages that make it clear that oil and gas is where they're at. You know, for example, after losing the the case against the carbon tax, uh, the provincial government announced an at at the pump rebate for drivers. And in the last budget, it announced a surcharge for electric vehicle drivers with the rational that, rationale that electric vehicles are not equally contributing to the gas tax, uh, as you know, which is a, a tax that that supports municipalities. But given the small number of electrical vehicles in the uh, in the province, the math is really difficult to to comprehend. And it has removed. We had a good program of incentives for solar. Uh, these have all been removed. Other challenges include, um, you know, a, a very vulnerable agricultural sector. Like the rest of Canada, uh, farm debt is getting increasingly higher um, and farm income is getting increasingly lower. Uh, the, these dynamics are, are true in Saskatchewan. We also have communities that have been traditionally reliant on fossil fuel extraction. And of course, they, these communities are fearful. Um, and unfortunately, when people are afraid, they tend to see only the threats and not the opportunity in change, which is perfectly understandable. Uh, I mean, they're thinking about themselves and their family and you know, what will these changes mean for my ability to provide for my family. Unfortunately, we see our provincial government and some industry feeding into this fear. Uh, for instance, uh, the co-op refinery in Regina, which recently had a fairly major uh, labor disruptions, uh, but now um, has recently announced that the upcoming, has, excuse me, uh, announced the upcoming elimination of 87 jobs. And the refinery said that the decision is due in large part to, I quote, operational efficiencies the company has achieved while preparing to shift toward the low carbon economy. Uh, so they're really kind of using this uh, low carbon card as a way of almost, uh, I don't know, blackmailing, not maybe not blackmailing workers, but but certainly put it make, making them feel vulnerable. But we have there's lots of work going on. Oh. Um, uh, sorry, we went one slide too far. Um, a lot of good work is being done on the ground by groups throughout Saskatchewan. Uh, for example, um, the prairie resilience strategy that was put out by the government of Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, uh, researched and wrote a very detailed critique of that strategy, um, acknowledging those parts that were good, like the methane strategy, but also pointing out those areas where um, the strategy was not really as as ambitious or as um, forward looking as as it could be. So, um, and that th this 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 report is available. It's it's quite a long report. I think it's about eighty seven pages. So it looks into to to the whole strategy in detail. Uh, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society has also done a uh, a, a critique of the. Um, the work of SASC Power in terms of moving forward to carbon free electricity. Uh, again, acknowledging where good work has been done, but where maybe uh, more improvements could be done. And this has been shared wild, widely throughout the, the province and also covered by the media. Um, hmm. um, Climate Justice Saskatoon did some, some really, really interesting work um, in reaching out to the coal producing uh, communities in, in Southern Saskatchewan to try and sort of um, bridge the gap and, and, and try and uh, find out what, what the fears and uh, concerns and uh, economic implications of, 
of moving away from coal had for these communities, but also sharing the economic implications of greenhouse, uh, of climate change. So we, uh, the CJS basically said that we believe that understanding each other's stories is an important step in building relationships between groups with different perspectives on this issue and in moving toward a low carbon transition in, in Saskatchewan. So this is a, a really good approach rather than just sort of um, trying to stay in the silos. There's been attempt to build bridges between those, those opposing views of this. Um, in Regina, Enviro Collective has been very, very active in supporting Fridays for Future. Um, this was going on every Friday for quite a long time until COVID hit, and so that it was a little bit, uh, uh, <laughs> for obvious reason, has slowed down. Another uh, really, my my slides are advancing very slowly. I apologize. Um, in Regina, uh, Enviro Collective and the Council of Canadians launched a major election sign campaign uh, that was very, very well received. And this was during the uh, both they used these both between uh, at the during the municipal election and during the provincial election. And I think uh, municipally it certainly had an impact because they did have a major turnover in their in their council to a council that was much more receptive to to climate action. And there's also some really good work being done in the in the agricultural realm. Uh, the National Farmers Union, which which is an organ uh, a national organization, but it is based in Saskatchewan, uh, put out this really really good report about a year and a half ago, which really looks at how the links between the farm crisis, the farm economic crisis, and the climate crisis, and how. Um, changing some of the ways that we uh, farm could help to address those two interrelated crises. Uh, the National Farmers Union is also working with a, another group called Farmers for Climate Solutions, which is a coalition of groups that are all working on that, uh, that, that dynamic of what, what is the impact of climate change on agriculture, but also what is the role of agriculture in, in reducing climate change? This is a very interesting report. And if you, if you wanted to find it, you can certainly look at the National Farmers Union website. And Another success story, uh, we have a, a very, very small uh, rurally based uh, group called the Citizens Environmental uh, Alliance. Uh, we're the ones who are instrumental in getting municipalities of Saskatchewan to pass the wetlands resolution. So, uh, you know, this, this was a very small group, but they went to the municipalities and made, made a convincing argument and, uh, have created momentum on, a, on an issue that's, that's very important in Saskatchewan in, in a number of ways, including the, the issue of green, greenhouse gas sequestration. So there are people in Saskatchewan who are working hard at, at making sure that these changes move ahead more quickly. Um, and I invite you to also wherever you are, whatever your talents are, is to, to join this, uh, this uh, cadre of people who are uh, possessed by a, a blessed unrest, <laughs> as, uh, as indicated in this quote by Agnes DeMille. Uh, it is this, there's only qu queer divine dissatisfaction, a, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and make us, makes us more alive than others. And, uh, Join us, uh, those who are using their voices, their votes, and their, their choices to, to fight the climate crisis. And as you know, your world depends on it. And I do want to acknowledge before we go into the question period 
that I have borrowed liberally from the work of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, Climate Justice Saskatoon, the National Farmers Union, uh, Enviro Collective in Regina, and the Regional Centre of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development. So um, I, I didn't embed any links, but any of these you can just Google and you'll be able to find information on, on the work that they're doing. So I'll turn it back to Kelly. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Well, that was incredible, incredible presentation, Margaret. Thank you so much for that. That was very informative. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen here. Okay, and does anybody have any questions for Margaret? Um, I think you could just put that in the chat if you yes. do have a question. So you might have to help me out with this a little bit for some uh, odd reason, my, um, my computer is reacting very slowly. Um, okay. And uh, so I'm just I'm I've got that little spinning ball, <laughs> so so that I can I, I'm going to leave my video off, uh, maybe just to sort of facilitate um, uh, uh, better audio. And do, do, are, yeah. do you have, do you do you have access to the questions there, Kelly? Uh, We've had some comments. I see. We do have some comments. Um, okay. Okay. Aditi, uh, Garg, these are excellent examples, Margaret. Thank you for preparing these slides. I need to go, but I appreciate your insights. Uh, from Emily, wonderful presentation. Thank you. And then Dean says, I think Bronwyn Merle has a question. Okay. But I don't see a question. <laughs> Yeah, I think Bronwyn has his hand up. So Bronwyn, if you could type in your question into the chat box, that would be great. Okay, so from Bronwyn, uh, what has happened to the money allocated for cleaning up old oil wells? Um, that uh, That is actually going ahead. Um, uh, as you recall, I think it was part of the COVID relief package, the, um, the uh, federal government had given the provincial government um, uh, a, a pack of money to um, clean old oil wells. And I don't know a lot about it, but I do, I do remember hearing on the radio just a couple of days ago that that work was progressing. And certainly that, that's going to have a, a big impact on that whole uh, uh, question that that methane question too so it uh yeah that, that that as far as i know that's going ahead but i don't know any details i apologize okay brown one says thanks <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> Okay, do we have any more questions? All right, uh, well, Thank you again, Margaret, for that. Okay. There's another, there's another question from Brown. Is there much interest in bison ranching? 
Um, well, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not an agricultural expert. I mean, I do, <laughs> I do know that there are our bison ranches around. Uh, in fact, we have one just around uh, down the street here, uh, or down the road a little ways. So it is, it is something that um, is happening. Um, it's not it's not to the extent I think that that cattle are still out there, but but bison is a premium meat, um, and farmers who do, or people who who raise bison uh, can get a premium price for it because it's a very lean meat. Um, so it is there, but the extent to which it's permeating the uh, the agriculture scene, I'm not I'm not certain. I do know that it is out there. And it is great meat if you ever have the opportunity to eat it. So <laughs> it's very lean. Okay, there's a comment from Rob uh, that I missed earlier. The Enviro Collective was awarded a seat on the Renewable Regina Community Advisory Group. Hmm. Yes, very good. Yes, uh, the Enviro Collective has been doing great work in, 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 in Regina. Um, I think their, their work was really the work that pushed the city of Regina to, to start looking at all of this seriously. Um, it, if Saskatoon was a little bit ahead of the, uh, the city of Regina and yeah, they've, uh, uh, they've been quite instrumental. And I believe that there's another group forming in Regina now to uh, uh, energy transitions Regina or something like that. So there seems to be growing momentum in the Regina area to, to make a change. Rob is a member of the Enviro Collective, so yeah. <laughs> okay, and then we have the Canada branch just saying the federal government commissioned a just transition task force to explore economic alternatives for coal communities. And what are the alternatives that emerged? And there is a link to that. Yeah, I, um, I know that, um, that, uh, I think she just left the meeting. <laughs> okay, uh, well, we'll wrap this up. Um, we just want to leave you with some concrete solutions and programs to get involved, whether or not you're a trained climate reality leader. Our mission as an organization is to build and connect networks of empowered individuals in communities across Canada by equipping equipping them with the tools and knowledge to bring about new behaviors and policies that lead to low carbon resilience and just future. I'm just gonna make this full screen. Okay, and there are endless ways you can help bring the structural change needed to solve the climate crisis. We have a selection of programs you can get involved in if you want to help raise ambition in Canadian climate policy at all levels. If you're a climate reality leader, you're already doing that through your active leadership, through activities that educate, drive action, and support solutions to climate change. And if you're not a climate reality leader, consider attending a leadership course training. Climate reality leaders are citizens of all backgrounds and from all over the world who have been trained by Al Gore to inspire change and talk about the science and solutions to climate change. There are over 30,000 worldwide and over 1,400 in Canada. To request a presentation by a climate reality leader or to join a leadership core yourself, head to climatereality.org. Okay. okay, and the Community Climate Hub Initiative is a network of citizen led groups that push for carbon neutrality at the municipal level by influencing policies and creating a space for meaningful participation in the democratic decision making process. To see if a hub exists in your area or to start one yourself, head to climatehub.ca. And you can also take part in our annual exercise in participative democracy, the National Climate League, whereby citizens collect data on indicators of quality of life to feed into our annual benchmarking standings report. To find out more and download the report, go to climatereality.ca slash NCL. 
And I believe most of these links are already pasted in the chat, but I will add the ones that aren't at the end of this. And the Campus Core Initiative is a student-led program that helps academic institutions become more responsible members of the community. To do this, Campus Core chapters have three main goals. One, create greener campuses by implanting sustainable practices. Two, bring administrations to divest from fossil fuels. And three, push for climate justice to be deeply ingrained in academic curriculums. We are currently leading our pilot year consisting of three university level campuses with the ultimate goal of expanding into other campuses and into le other levels of education. We currently have two of our three pilot student groups formed, and if you'd like to help shape the third or wish to stay in the loop for future expansions of the program, please head to climatereality.ca slash campus dash core. And finally, there are endless ways that your day-to-day -day actions can advance solutions to the climate crisis. Here are our top 10. I will just let you read that. We recognize that not everyone is equal in accessing these types of actions, which is why acknowledging privilege is essential and fighting for climate justice is vital. Above all, let's keep in mind that the goal of individual actions is to scale up the community, which is only possible for everyone if effective and equitable public policies are in place. So that's it for today. Uh, if Margaret was here, I would be thanking her, saying that was a very amazing and informative presentation. Uh, but thank you to everybody else that joined this event. Uh, we hope you will join us for more inspiring stories and solutions from our next webinar series from Alberta on July 8th at 6.30 p.m. local time.